Okay, well, welcome everyone. Um, tonight we have uh, Mr. Pickerel, Dennis Pickerel, and since 2008 he has served as the executive director of Stenton, a national land, a historic landmark in Northwest Philadelphia administered by the National Society of the Colonial Dames in, Phil in Pennsylvania. Um, we talked a little bit about Stenton um, in my presentation a couple weeks ago, so it's really interesting overlap here. Uh, Dennis holds an MA in American Studies from Penn State and is an alumnus of the Addingham Summer School Program for the Study of the English Country House. For seven years, he served as the president of Historic Germantown, a consortium of 18 historic sites, an arboretum, and an art museum located in America's longest national historic district. He was a co-organizer of the 2014 Interdisciplinary Conference, James Logan and the Networks of Atlantic Culture and Politics, uh, 1699 to 1751. And the 2018 conference, which was investigating Mid-Atlantic Plantations, Slavery, Economics, and Space, co-sponsored by Stenton, the McNeil Center for Early American Studies at the University of Pennsylvania, the Library Company of Philadelphia and the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. He's currently serving as the project director for Inequality in Bronze, Monumental Plantation Legacies, which is a multi-year project funded by ma a major grant from the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage. So I'll turn it over to you, Dennis. All right, well, thank you, Judy. Um, thank you everyone for having me. Uh, and I wanna say a special thank you to uh, Rick Hyman for reaching out to me about doing this. Um, I think, I hope uh, all of you are familiar with Stenton. I know Rick talks us up, I'm sure he does. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not gonna go uh, too in depth into uh, some of the things we traditionally talk about with Stenton. Um, but I really wanna talk about uh, the Inequality in Bronze project, which we've been in the midst of for uh, the last two years. I'm going to get the slideshow going here and then we'll get rolling. Okay, can everybody see that? Great. <clears throat> yes. Excellent. Um, so uh, Inequality in Bronze uh, is a project that in a lot of ways is uh, a pretty major departure from um, what historically has been the focus of our interpretation at Stenton. Uh, and while we have four interpretive themes and cover a, a wide range of topics, um, traditionally, James Logan has been the sun around which all of our stories at, at Stenton have uh, revolved. Um, and that has changed with this <clears throat> project that we've been doing for the last two years. So um, the, the project's actually called Inequality in Bronze Monumental Plantation Legacies, but you see the subtitle here, Shared Authority, which is about um, how we've been working with our neighbors, and we're going to talk about that, and collaborative commemoration at Stenton, because if we've done this project right, it should be something that uh, is not the product of what um, our staff and our governing board thinks is important for Stenton, but it's the product of consensus between ourselves and, and our community. <clears throat> so just to uh, give you a little bit of context about how we got started with this project, um, it really goes back several years now um, when we were approached by the Association for Public Art, which manages a lot of the monuments and uh, statues that you see around Philadelphia in public squares, along the school, and places like that. They approached us and said, we have this monument to James Logan that was created in uh, 1939 by Thomas Pimcoat for the Library Company of Philadelphia. And it was created to stand on the steps of the Ridgeway Annex, which was part of the Library Company at that time. It was on Broad Street. And after um, that library folded, uh, of course, the library company is still around, but after the annex folded, uh, the monument itself went into storage and um, has been there ever since. And uh, for a number of years now, it's actually been stored in the basement of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Of course, they're doing a big construction project, so they're looking to clear out everything there. Thus, um, the association approached us. Um, after some discussion, um, our board decided to accept the gift. And as we began planning for you know, the things that we needed to do to accept the monument, we realized that we had another issue, and <clears throat> it was actually one of our board members that first raised this. In our collection, we have this plaque that you see on your left, 
with this Cuban woman named Dinah, who was um, once enslaved at Stenton. She became uh, a paid servant. Um, and the Dames and the Site and Relic Society of uh, Germantown, which is now the Germantown Historical Society, erected a plaque to her in Stenton Park in 1912. And the plaque reads, in memory of Dinah, the faithful colored caretaker of Stenton, who by her quick thought and presence of mind, saved the mansion from being burned by British soldiers in the winter of 1777. So if you read this, immediately you realize it's problematic in a number of ways. Obviously it uses language that we would not use today, but more importantly, it characterizes this woman, Dinah, as essentially a faithful servant. And uh, it's erected at a time when there are actually quite a few monuments to enslaved people um, that are being put up across the US, um, characterizing them as faithful servants. Um, so, you know, we wanted to get to the bottom of this and we wanted to think about what do we do with this plaque and how do we think about commemorating Dinah in the 21st century and think about how do we elevate her story and the stories of other enslaved and indentured servants um, to put them uh, more on par with the story that we're telling about uh, James and Logan. So where does this story come from? Um, well, just to summarize the story briefly, essentially this is kind of how it goes or how it was re retold for many years. Um, um, it takes place in 1777 when the British have occupied Philadelphia. At that time, uh, there are no Logans at Stenton. Um, there, Dinah is living there and um, possibly other caretakers and servants. And according to the story, one, one day there's a knock at the door and uh, there are these British soldiers who uh, say to Dinah, we have orders to burn this house down. Where is the barn located? So what is Dinah going to do? Of course, she escorts the soldiers to the barn and this goes on for some time and we're supposed to imagine what Dinah is thinking until uh, at last, there's another knock at the door. She opens the door, and this time there's a British officer. And he says to her, um, we're looking for deserters. Have you seen any? And she says, oh, yeah, they're hiding out in the barn. Quick, go get them. Well, the soldiers are arrested, and due to Dinah's quick thinking, Stenton is saved. This is how the story goes, at least. Now, the story does uh, have some grounding in fact. It's actually first written down by Deborah Norris Logan. Deborah Norris marries James Logan's grandson. James Logan is the builder of Stenton in 1822. Uh, she does not refer to Dinah, however. She just refers to an old domestic or old woman. The story is sort of perpetuated. It's reprinted in various forms throughout the 19th century. Um, by 1897, um, uh, it, Dinah's name is inserted in place of the domestic or old woman, so Dinah suddenly becomes associated with it. We don't really know why exactly. Uh, and then kind of through the 20th century, Dinah really uh, uh, that's the story gains this kind of mythic status in Germantown. Uh, it, it becomes, you know, part of the oral tradition of Germantown. She becomes this heroine uh, in the community in a lot of ways. And so we get these kind of, uh, I don't know, the best way to describe it is maybe these kind of uh, pop culture like um, uh, 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 portrayals of Dinah um, because nobody really knows a lot about her other than the story. So of course we have the plaque, which you see in the center of this image here. Uh, on the bottom, in the bottom left-hand corner here, you can see this image is actually from a 1952 insurance ad. And it's this kind of essentially racist image, mammy-like image of Dinah saving the house. And basically the ad equivalent, equivalent uh, is equivalent, you know, it's getting insurance for your house is, the same as having a Dinah to save your house. This is what the, the ad is trying to portray. Um, but we also have, you know, modern portrayals of Dinah, this um, mural arts mural, which is um, uh, maybe a decade old, um, portrays Dinah as a first person interpreter, Irma Gardner Hammond. Um, and then there have even, as we've been doing this project, there have been um, some folks we've been involved with who are doing African American genealogy who are trying to connect Dinah to the Bustle family, a very prominent African-American family. Cyrus Bustle um, is sort of well known during the American Revolution, although there's no direct evidence um, to link her to that. So we have all these sort of competing representations of Dinah who, you know, uh, that we're reckoning with. But what hadn't really been done is paying attention to the documentary evidence that exists about her and her family. Um, and so in coming through that, we realized that there is a good bit out there that we can learn about her, starting with things like William Logan's will here from 1772, 
and that will tells us that uh, how Dinah came to Stenton, we know now that she came as essentially part of a dowry, that she had belonged to the Emlyn family and was given um, to Hannah Emlyn when she married William Logan, and that's how she ended up at Stenton. Uh, we know that she had a daughter uh, named Bess who was freed. Uh, we know that she had a grandson. We also know um, that Dinah was freed um, in 1776 and um, that her manumission was reported here. And we find, again, some more interesting things here that she had been owned uh, by Hannah Logan from uh, here, quote unquote, the time of her childhood. And that more importantly, that she had really asked for, she had requested her freedom uh, from the Logans. She had agency in gaining her freedom. This was never a part of the story uh, of Dinah. Um, we have the manumission document for her grandson, Cyrus. Um, but importantly, if you look here, you note that he won't actually gain his freedom until he's 21 years old. We know from a lot of records that Dinah stayed on as a paid servant. There are quite a few records that show her um, being paid wages, which you see here in this almanac. And then that sort of raises the question of why did Dinah even bother to stay at Stenton? Um, and of course, there are a lot of reasons, you know, uh, being able to afford your own residence, your own house, having lived for somewhere for most of your life with your family. And, and one of the really provocative reasons she may have stayed is because, again, her grandson, even though he was freed, wasn't really free until his 21st birthday. Uh, one of the really compelling um, uh, stories um, that we learned about Dinah, uh, which we had not been telling, was uh, the story of how her family was separated. Like so many enslaved people, um, she and her family were, were split apart. Um, her husband remained, at the em remained in, with the Emlyn family when she came to Stenton. And a curious episode happened. In 1757, William and Hannah Logan purchased him and now by that time, uh, the Quaker meeting had shifted its attitudes pretty firmly against slavery and was really moving toward abolition. And so it was it very much frowned upon for them to do this. So uh, the meeting appointed two investigators to find out exactly what had happened, and they recorded it um, in the monthly meeting records. So what we found out, we still don't know Dinah's husband's name. He's unnamed in the document. Um, but that he was sold out of the Emlyn family when George Emlyn died, and that he had become ill and his purchaser wanted to sell him again, and he was essentially afraid of being sold far away from his family. Um, the investigators described him as, quote unquote, begging William and Hannah Logan to buy him, although that, those are their words. I like to think that he convinced them. And moreover, this is speculation, but given uh, Dinah's uh, close connections to the Logan family, we like to think that she played some role in really bringing her family back together and convincing the Logans uh, to bring him there. So um, they were successful in bringing him to Stenton and they offered to free him, but he refused the offer because of his poor health and because he wanted to stay with his wife. Um, and, and so they permitted that. Um, and so in this case, the Logans ultimately were not disowned by the meeting, which they very well could have been um, because it was deemed a, a humanitarian act. So it tells us a little bit, uh, tells us a lot about Again, Dinah's agency, how she's bringing her family back together, but also, you know, um, the violence of breaking families apart that is uh, so much a part of, of slavery. And then the, the real dichotomy of that is um, uh, when she becomes a paid servant, um, the third generation writes about her uh, very, very affectionately. And I think that's in large part because she probably had something to do with the upbringing of James Logan's grandson, George Logan. Um, so there's a lot of talk about, uh, you know, affection, you know, for Dinah, uh, these kinds of things. Um, so you, you have this real dichotomy going on between these generations. Uh, we also learn things about um, what her life, little things that help us understand what her life might have been like. Uh, in 1760, while she was still a young woman, um, Hannah Logan purchased a gown for Dinah at 15 shillings, um, which suggests she was fairly well dressed. She may have really been uh, working as almost uh, like an attendant or sort of a lady's maid um, to Hannah Logan. And here is another reference when she's much older in 1793, and she lived for quite a long time. Uh, she lived until about 1805. 
Um, but this reference is to her, it says, but poor Dinah scalded her foot yesterday. So even as she's getting into advanced stage, she's clearly still doing, you know, toiling and, and doing some pretty hard work um, in, in around the property, uh, even as a paid servant. So that's kind of when I, when we talk about the project, we'll we'll talk about kind of three legs of it. One is understanding this um, a much fuller story of Dinah, which is really important. You know that she's much more than just this kind of myth of saving the house from burning by the British, true, true or untrue. Um, the second is um, Stenton and the community in which it is located. If you haven't been to Stenton, Stenton is located where uh, three neighborhoods converge, kind of right on the edge of Northwest and North Philadelphia. Uh, it's where Germantown, Logan, and Nicetown come together. And um, the community in which we were located is a community that has a very high poverty rate, approaching 45%. Um, we have issues of blight and crime and a lot of just serious 21st century um, issues that our, our residents are dealing with. And so the question becomes, how can a place like Stenton be relevant to our neighbors and tell meaningful stories? Um, and also the community is largely African American. So how can we move, move kind of beyond the stories of the great white man and, and tell, tell more stories that are more inclusive? Um, and then I'll just mention that, um, uh, so if you're kind of at Stenton, you know, it's a, a beautiful location, there's three acres, there's gardens, this is what it looks like. But if you're walking around the outside of Stenton, this is what you see, this is what our neighbors see. Um, you see a 10 foot high fence with barbed wire and a screen that is, is not very welcoming. And so that was part of what we had to overcome as well, is getting people to understand that we wanted to be a part of the community and that we wanted to be welcoming and we wanted people to enjoy uh, this place. And there you just get another sense of the neighborhood that Stenton's located in, a uh, very dense uh, neighborhood of row homes and industrial buildings. Uh, we're also a part of Stenton Park, so we are located on the corner here, but there's another six acres that historically was part of the property. It's now <clears throat> rec fields and parkland and uh, that kind of a thing. So the big idea behind this project, um, one, work with our neighbors in a new way to create a 21st century memorial to, to Dinah. Um, and so for us, um, this is really about sharing authority. It's about doing something we've never done before, stepping back and asking um, neighbors in our community to be a part of the decision-making process um, at Stenton, which is something that a lot of historic sites are exploring now, but you know, haven't, it hasn't been a part of the way that they've operated in the past. Uh, second, to elevate and commemorate Donna's full story. Again, how can, we, how can we really celebrate the richness and fullness of, of her life beyond just the story of the saving in the house? And then thirdly, again, we, we began thinking about this project several years ago now, so events have, have really kind of overtaken us uh, with what's going on in, in currently, but addressing this ongoing national debate, which is now more relevant than ever about monuments, you know, monuments to enslavers like James Logan. But from our perspective, more importantly, on um, the absence of memorials to uh, uh, African Americans uh, and their contributions uh, to the history of America, um, how can we address that? Um, we were successful in receiving grant funding from the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage. We received a $300,000 grant. Um, back in uh, June of 2018, which is, um, is, is been the primary funding for this project. And then we knew when we were putting the project together too that we were gonna need a really good team of consultants and advisors to help us through the project. That this was just not the kind of work that we are, are have done before um, and um, we need to help guide us. Uh, and so you see two of the most important members of our team here in the upper right is a woman named Dina Bailey who has their own consulting firm, but works a lot with the International Sites of Conscience. Um, but uh, she was uh, our community meetings facilitator and works a lot in the areas of diversity, inclusion, equity, and access, but also just a terrific person for um, really creating well-structured meetings, um, getting good feedback um, from the people who are attending, helping everyone to consensus. Uh, so she was really critical. And then on the lower left, uh, there's, you see a woman named Nisa Page Lieberman, who was essentially our public art curator for the project. Remember, we we're creating a new memorial. So we had to also create a whole process for 
how we were going to um, capture, you know, this feedback and steer it to potential artists, how we would identify the artists, the whole process of actually creating the memorial, uh, which was pretty complicated and something we had never done before. So um, she was uh, a terrific help with that. Beyond that, there have been lots of other consultants uh, doing things like evaluation and documentation. Um, we have a whole team of project advisors. Um, <clears throat> these are people who have really been working, especially in um, uh, the fields of um, public art and monuments, um, telling black and indigenous stories, through arts, history, and culture. Um, people were kind of on the cutting edge of that, um, involved with projects like Monument Lab, you might be familiar with um, in Philadelphia. We also put together a team of what we called um, community ambassador, ambassadors. These were neighbors um, that we had met or met at the beginning of the project. Um, who especially were, uh, for the most part, leaders in the community, involved with certain institutions, people who could really um, help us get the word out and um, uh, help, uh, help us make other neighbors feel welcomed um, to our meetings um, and, and really to also be a sounding board um, for us um, throughout the project. So just to um, kind of go over the broad strokes again of the project, again, we, we had sort of three, three big legs of it. One was um, these community meetings, which we'll talk about more in just a minute, this idea of having on all these focus groups to um, really conceptualize the project, to talk about what kind of memorial do we want, um, and to capture and share all this information with artists. Uh, you know, again, this curator-led community inclusive process to actually identify who the artist would be to make sure we have the right artist. And then we have what I think of as the kitchen sink uh, leg of the project, which is a lot of um, other various things that are connected to it. Um, Archaeology, um, a partnership with Temple University, a conference on Mid-Atlantic Plantations. Um, so we'll talk about some of those projects. So we'll start with the community meetings because, again, they are so important um, to this project and, and really are what the, the whole sort of structure of it is built around. And we started in December of 2018 and have had a whole series of meetings since then. We actually had some more meetings planned for the spring, but of course those have been derailed like everything else. Um, but the point of these meetings, each meeting was structured to discuss kind of a different aspect of the project. So we started out with uh, in December, which is trying to gather some baseline information. You know, what, what did people really know about Dinah? What was their, their context about her? Um, you know, what should a memorial look like? Uh, and remember, you know, Dinah had become um, a, a really kind of a community hero, heroine. So even if people weren't terribly knowledgeable about Stenton, a lot of people knew about Dinah already. Um, and uh, this is where Dina really came in and, and steered us in the right direction and was so helpful to us. Uh, she came up with these great exercises for capturing information. So I remember in one meeting we had um, this discussion about, you know, what do people want? Do they really want uh, a, a, an absolutely factual representation of Diana in the memorial? Or do they want something that's kind of representative that embodies the values that people think they are, that they associate with Dinah? And so we had sort of like the sliding scale that people had to kind of pick. Um, and the little exercise that you see here in the lower right, um, this was actually a word exercise. So Dina had people um, select things um, that they thought values, kind of values or words that they associated with what a potential memorial would look like. So um, there were different categories, like there was texture, they had to pick whether it was slick or rough, and then they had to pick kind of, you know, sort of things they associated with Dinah. Was she brave? Was she, you know, uh, intelligent? Was she this? Was she that? Um, and of course, we talked about, you know, beyond the project, what, what, what does really an authentic partnership look like between the museum and the community? What are the things that we need to be doing and how do we meet, meet people halfway? Um, again, just sort of going down this line of thought, you know, thinking about the language of the memorial, what should be on it, if anything, um, materials, all these kinds of things. Uh, one of the really interesting meetings we had, I think, and one that really uh, was provocative and got people talking was in June. Um, 
we had a woman from uh, who's a PhD student at George Mason named Ayandala Cole, and she has done a lot of research into the Mamie stereotype, and that's a big issue for us with this project because that's well, that's absolutely a thing we want to avoid conveying when we commemorate Dinah and when, when we portray her. And so Ayandala came and talked about that and talked about how the Mamie stereotype started, but also how it's been perpetuated through popular culture. And one of the things she talked about, which <laughs> really resonated just recently, was Aunt Jemima and how the Aunt Jemima brand started, the history of that. And of course, we've seen just recently that that was retired. Um, but it was a really a fascinating discussion. And I think um, one that, you know, really left everyone kind of going away thinking about how we represent um, Dinah. So once we had gathered all of this information, uh, which was a lot, <laughs> collected it. In fact, if you, I'll show you at the end, we have a kind of a project website archive. And if you're interested, you can go and look at summaries of all of these community meetings. We, sh we, cause we wanted to share this with the potential artist. Um, we started developing a process to actually identify that artist. And after some discussion with our advisors, we decided it wouldn't just be an open call. One of the things that our funders really demands is uh, excellence in all aspects of the project, including the, the kinds of artists that we would select. So um, we worked with the advisors and we narrowed it down to a list of about um, 20 artists internationally and solicited um, an RFP from them, looked at those and whittled that list down to three finalists who you see here, who each submitted proposals and agreed to come for a day in September and do two public presentations about what um, their sort of concept for a Dyna Memorial would look like. And they came up with three very different ideas. Um, what you see on the uh, far left um, was created by artist um, uh, Levon Bell. And uh, it really is this kind of goddess uh, uh, sort of uh, motif here. But um, in, in the uh, sort of base of the, the memorial here, um, you have things like um, a garden of um, herbs and things that what was traditionally thought of as a slave garden herbs and plants and things like that that were um, planted by enslaved people um, when they were allowed to garden. Um, paths here, which are meant to mimic um, wampum bands, so a nod to the indigenous history of Stenton, which is also very complicated. Um, and many of you are probably familiar with James Logan's involvement in the walking purchase. Um, so that was a, a fascinating proposal. Um, the proposal um, in the middle is from uh, Kintura Davis, who's based in LA. Uh, Laban is in St. Croix, by the way, uh, and so brought the sort of Caribbean perspective of, of enslavement and all that's involved with that with it. <clears throat> um, Kintura Davis came up with this proposal, which was this fascinating um, kind of sculpture mounted on a plinth and uh, really just kind of an ingenious idea. She had this idea of taking a time-lapse photo of a woman in a head wrap turning so that you never really saw the woman's face, uh, sort of in the same way that we can never really totally grasp Dinah. Uh, we can only sort of partially create this representation of her. And this would be printed on essentially these multiple layers of glass, which would uh, be fused together. And uh, you can see the form of it mimics uh, a miniature. Uh, so it's just a really interesting idea. And the third idea was from Karen Olivier, who uh, is not from Philadelphia, but is based here now. She's actually the head of the Temple Sculpture Department. Um, and she came up with um, the idea of, I think what is probably the most, um, I guess I would say sort of the most reflective space of the three. Um, this idea that you could kind of sit in this space and there are these tablets here with these questions that um, provoke you to think about Dinah's life and, and what it was like. So, um, Again, this being a collaborative process, we did not make the decision. We actually worked with our evaluator to come up with a rubric, and everybody who came to the public meetings had to fill out the rubric. We also posted it online. We got lots of feedback. We consulted with our advisors, and kind of at the end of it, um, the consensus was uh, Karen's um, uh, vision of, of the memorial. It's been an interesting challenge because um, Karen is a sculptor, 
but she's never really created a memorial in a landscape quite like this. So we really had to pull in our landscape architect at Stinton, and so that idea continues to be refined. Um, but you know, one of the most important aspects of it is the idea of these two tablets on either side, which have this silhouette that represents Diana and these questions. And these questions are really, the idea is really supposed to sit and think about these and, and these, you know, will, will hopefully, you know, you'll come away with a, a much more full sense of, of what Dinah's life might have been like. But these questions are, are really great. Uh, they're things like, what was your full name? We don't know Dinah's last name. Uh, where were you born and how did you arrive here? We don't know that. How did freedom feel? What was your greatest joy and your greatest sorrow? Did you have a favorite part of every day? What was your wildest dream? Who took care of you? Uh, who and what did you think of most as you grew old? And then here's a really provocative one. And I will say that we haven't totally settled on these yet, um, but I'll, I'll be curious to hear if any of you have thoughts about this. Did you have moments when you wished you had let it burn? So it really challenges this idea that Dinah would just reflexively save the mansion. Um, and how do you wish to be remembered? And then on the opposite side, there's another tablet that are questions for you. What is your name? When were you born and what led you here? And then the sort of flip side of, you know, um, you know, did you ever wish you had let it burn? Would you have saved Stanton? And I like that because that touches on this idea of the, today of, of preservation and stewardship, stewardship. So. And here you just get an idea of how we're trying to situate these things. This is the mansion here, which is the museum. This is where our Logan Memorial ended up. And in 2016, we planted a meadow here and we have a mown path that leads to it. And it's really great because we used to just sort of lead people around to the mansion to start tours, but now we have rerouted that to um, walk people through our colonial garden, up the meadow path, and we sort of start at the Logan Memorial. But now that once the Diner Memorial is in place, we will have an opportunity to talk about these two memorials in dialogue. And more importantly, the Dinah Memorial is really sited in front of the mansion. So it you know, just challenges, again, that traditional narrative that we have of, of how we talk about Stenton. There's another image here. So um, to kind of um, shift gears a little bit and uh, get into the third leg, which is you know, what I like to think of as the kitchen sink, all these other little projects that relate to the, the, the larger thing. Um, Obviously, this has made us rethink uh, our interpretation in a lot of ways. And, you know, coming out of this, we're going to have to have an interpretive planning project. It doesn't mean we're not going to tell the story of James Logan or Deborah Norris Logan, but it does mean we're going to recenter things, that we're going to tell more of these stories that we haven't been telling. Um, and so we've already started doing some, some things um, to change that. One of the things that we've done is we have... Um, opened up one of the rooms in the garret, and we know from James Logan's inventory that there were three spaces, at least three spaces, that were furnished for uh, servants and possibly enslaved people. Those rooms have not been open to the public for a long time. They've been filled with archives and collection storage, our curator's office is in one, and the one that we opened up is actually, I used to like to call it the room where spinning wheels went to die. Um, because it was full of spinning wheels and uh, uh, looms. And the dames had this uh, kind of spinning room in the wing in the uh, early 20th century where they would dress in colonial costume and demonstrate our industrial heritage. And so um, in a lot of ways, this was like a literal sweeping away of the colonial revival to make space to talk about um, Dinah and other, um, uh, the rest of the labor force at Stenton. So you can see some of that here. Um, archaeology was another part of what we were doing, not necessarily digging, but we decided to do a ground penetrating radar study. Um, one of the really looming questions was where was Dinah buried? And we know that she was buried somewhere near Stenton. Um, Deborah Norris Logan writes about visiting her burial, uh, it being sort of under this big tree and, and all this sort of thing. And then there were some 20th century references to Dinah potentially be, being buried near the site of where the plaque was originally mounted in the park. So that, that actually marked the tomb of Dinah potentially. And we knew where that location was. It was near the recreation center. 
So we hired uh, AECOM to do a day of ground penetrating radar surveys and they surveyed two locations. One was the location of where the plaque was mounted and the other was the location of a Logan family cemetery that had existed in Stenton Park. And this is what it used to look like. It had this sort of wonderful stone wall and note the kind of the sort of round, half rounded coping stones here on top of the wall. Well, that's what's left of them today. So in the middle of the uh, 20th century, the city um, sort of decided that the cemetery was a source of uh, vandalism and um, that you know, they were gonna solve the problem by, we, we thought that they had demolished it. We thought that they had essentially raised the cemetery. Um, they did not alert the dames and the cemetery by an ordinance of the city had been given, the dames had been given custody of it, but nobody told the dames this. And so they were able to save a, a handful of headstones, but you know, came out to see the cemetery was essentially gone one day. Um, so we surveyed this cemetery too, because A, we wanted to establish the boundaries of it, but B, we sort of thought, well, it could be possible that Dinah is buried near here as well, and that other, you know, other people, enslaved or indentured workers were buried there as well. And you see, we did, you know, this was a really fascinating project. We, we did establish the boundaries of it. And what the archaeologists actually found was that, um, that um, it wasn't raised after all, that it was actually buried under six to seven feet of fill. So the city had brought in truckloads of soil and buried the thing. So you can see here, if you look at these lines, if you follow my cursor, uh, this is, these are actually surviving segments of the wall. And what we're seeing here, we believe, are upright headstones that were buried in place of Logan family members from the early to mid 19th century. But the disappointing thing about all of this was that we did not find Dinah's burial. Um, now, fast forward to um, February of this year, we're doing some research at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, and we're going through a collection that we haven't, we really weren't aware of and, and didn't know about, and come across this almanac from Deborah Norris Logan, and find in it that there is a record of Dinah's death when she was buried uh, on the 21st and that she was buried in the garden at Stenton and that she had requested to be buried there during her lifetime at Stenton. So we now know that she's buried in this location, which is on the south side of the mansion, potentially within the fence line or just on the other side of it. I really wish we had known this before we spent $5,000 on GPR, <laughs> but this is a, a future project. Um, to follow up on and a fascinating one and it really gives the memorial all the more meaning now to know that she's buried somewhere near um, in close proximity to the museum. Um, we had a partnership with um, Temple University with the Center for Public History and Dr. Seth Brueggemann, uh, his, particularly his museum um, class and uh, they came and visited Stenton. They did um, some really terrific research helping us better understand the context in which the original 1912 plaque was erected and some of the issues that were going on at that time. For instance, um, around the same time in the early 1900s, the Daughters of the Confederacy were trying to get a national monument to Mammies erected on the National Mall, believe it or not. So this is the context in which this is created. But the students, as their final project, were challenged to come up with their own concept for a Dyna Memorial. And some of them were very creative um, these students had this idea that was really very much about like the hands of Dinah and how she touched various aspects of the house and that you could have these hands sort of throughout the house represented in various ways. The one on the right I thought was particularly interesting. Those students came up with this idea of literally creating a grave for the, the 1912 plaque and kind of burying that representation of her um, to create something new entirely. Um, as part of the project, we also created a, a park and museum community partnership, um, which was entirely new for us. This came out of our, our community discussions and in talks with our community ambassadors. And so now as a group, we're working to advocate for resources and improvements to both the park and the museum and thinking about ways that we can collaborate um, uh, together uh, on programming. We uh, actually hosted a health fair, a community health fair in August of last year. 
together and you might sort of say, well, Dennis, why is the museum doing a health fair? But we, the museum had an open house the same day and we had some 250 residents come through, 50 of which who had never been in the museum before who came uh, just because we had this event going on. In October, um, we were co-hosts of a, a major event, um, an interdisciplinary conference on uh, investigating mid-Atlantic plantations. Uh, it was a partnership with the McNeil Center for the uh, for Early American Studies at the University of Pennsylvania, the Penn Preservation Graduate Program, the Library Company in Cliveden, um, and really bringing together all stripes of people, um, over 100 academics, public historians, museum professionals, and others to think about mid-Atlantic plantations in, in lots of different ways to think about their labor forces, their economies, their landscapes, their architecture. Um, part of that was an overnight stay with about 25 participants um, working with Joe McGill, the Slave Dwelling Project, where participants stayed in the Garrett and other service spaces at Stenton and talked about uh, what, what that was like, what life was like, connecting that to uh, social justice and issues of race uh, today. Um, in January, we hosted a, a scholar summit um, where we brought together colleagues and academics um, from institutions doing a lot of similar work, um, really to kind of do some thought mapping about how we're going to move forward with our interpretation in the future and how we continue the community engagement uh, that we've begun through this project. And then ongoing research is um, such a, is, continues to be a huge part of what we're doing. And, and I'll just offer you a couple of examples here for contrast with Dinah Story, that Dinah Story is, is certainly not the be all and end all um, of, of talking about the labor force at Stanton, um, both again, enslaved labor and, and indentured workers. Um, but this letter is, um, uh, dated 1723 from James Logan to Gibbons and Allen in Carolina. And James Logan is essentially writing to them, trying to consign a young enslaved man because as James Logan wrote, he directed his inclination to the wrong color and servants of the plantation, generally of the fairer sort. In other words, he was fraternizing with, uh, with white women servants and James Logan found that no longer tolerable uh, nor did I think it fit to keep him anywhere in the pro in the province. So, uh, and the next reference is um, these are actually uh, court records um, uh, <clears throat> dealing with a, a young enslaved man named Samson, who burned down what was described as a dwelling house that was owned by James Logan in the township of Bristol. So it was almost certainly. Uh, a building that was on Stenton. And James Logan sat with other justices in judgment of him. Um, he was uh, he was going to be executed. A group of freeholders um, advocated uh, for commuting his sentence. And ultimately he was banished out of the colonies, um, possibly sent somewhere in the Caribbean. We don't, we don't really know. Um, so we have not just the story of Dinah, but these other stories that we'll be telling, stories of resistance. Uh, stories that, you know, really um, describe uh, the violence and, and, and pain of slavery in, in ways that we haven't been communicating in the past. Um, and historically, we had relied on a historic structure report that was completed in 1982, but uh, we're finding that uh, these records are, are very much incomplete, that a lot of these names that I'm, I'm referencing now um, aren't in here, and how and why they miss those names, you know, we, we just don't know but clearly we need to paint a complete picture. So um, as we move forward, we are thinking about Stenton, again, going back to the beginning, not as this kind of, you know, James Logan is the sun around which everything revolves, but uh, Stenton is a constellation of stories, situating it within the context of the larger transatlantic world in a better way. Um, talking about all these stories um, together, uh, Dinah's story, Cyrus's story, the stories of Native American interactions, Deborah Norris Logan. How do we give these more equal weight uh, in, in the telling? And I think one of the great projects that, again, has been kind of derailed by the pandemic, but hopefully we'll get back on track once life uh, uh, returns to normal. 
is um, we've been working with Irma Gardner Hammond here, who was the president of um, Keepers of the Culture and is a storyteller and has portrayed Dinah for probably 20 some odd years now um, <clears throat> to uh, enhance her portrayal of, of uh, Dinah. And we've been working with her and Bob Branch. Uh, many of you may know, he works with Historic Philadelphia Inc. He portrayed uh, Octavius Caddo for a while, does some writing for them, but he's been helping us create a much richer story for Irma. Um, <clears throat> you know, things like, what was it like to be pregnant and to be a servant in the Logan household? You know, what was it like to encounter free African-Americans? Uh, how, how did she interact with her husband who she was separated from? So. Um, we're really excited about the opportunity to debut that once we can all get together um, the way we used to do. Um, and also, uh, you know, uh, organizational change. I'll just say none of this really happens for the long term if we don't change as an organization. Um, the Colonial Dames, as you might expect, is a, is a largely white organization. Um, and, you know, they recognize that. They recognize uh, the issues that go along with that, and they're very much committed uh, to be an, being an organization that incorporates diversity, equ equity, access, and inclusion into our work. We know that we need to get more diverse as an organization. Um, we've started that process um, with our board retreat last year and integrating some things like racial competency training. And then again, really thinking about what shared authority means. You know, can we start to change our governance structure in a way that allows neighbors to be a part of Stenton Committee and some of the other governing um, bodies <coughs> of the museum. So drawing to a close here, um, again, uh, if you're interested in the project and want to know more about it, I'd encourage you to go to our website. We have a tab that says Dinah. And almost all the stuff that I've referenced here from the research to uh, the conference to um, community meetings, it's all archived on this site so you can explore it um, at your leisure. And, you know, um, you know, we're in the process of thinking about, of course, what's next? How do we bring this project to a close, but also, you know, uh, not lose the momentum that we've gained uh, from working with our neighbors? So. We're hoping the memorial schedule is off track due to the pandemic. We had hoped to have that done by kind of June, but now it's going to be more like October. And if we can't have a celebration in October, it may be the following spring. We'll see. But we're hoping to at least have the construction done by October. Um, and I think that will follow on with an interpretive planning project, really, again, rethinking how we tell the stories, which stories are most important at Stenton. It doesn't mean we're not going to tell the story of James Logan. Um, and some of the stories that we've been telling, but it means we're going to be incorporating more and, and maybe balancing those uh, in a better way. And, you know, again, most importantly, how do, we, how do we maintain and build on these new relationships with our neighbors? And if we're doing it in the right way, it means it happens something like this picture you see here where Dennis is speeding into the background a little bit and that our neighbors are becoming advocates for Stenton or becoming the voice of Stenton uh, more so than just myself. So. So I will end there and uh, I am happy to um, answer any questions um, that you may have. Thank you, Dennis, that was fabulous. So um, there are a few questions out here. Let me take a look for, um, well, I think, I think you answered this pretty well, but it's from Jim Murphy. How do you involve the community and still make sure your info is historically accurate. I think you, you really answered that pretty well, but if you want to say anything more to that. Yeah, no, that, that's a really great question. <laughs> it's a really good question, and it's one we've been wrestling with, and um, you know, it, some of it means, honestly, letting go a little bit. So, you know, we can obviously, we can share information, we can, and that's what we've tried to do. You know, through our website, we put a lot of the research online, we make it all publicly available. But ultimately, it's up to people to interpret the way they want to interpret it. So some of our community ambassadors who are fierce advocates for this project, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it in ways differently and about Dinah's history differently than we might. Um, and I think we've had to kind of learn through this process to let go of some of that. You know what I mean? I mean, 
it's about getting the larger message across in the end, I guess I would say. Mm -hmm. um, we noticed a barbed wire fence and it's still there. Is there <laughs> any, you know, I, I, the second question, you know, why, but um, so was there, has there been any discussion about being able to take that down or? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so it's very expensive to take down and replace a fence, which is what we would really like to do <laughs> with something much less imposing. Um, but what we have done is um, we're addressing that issue in a number of ways. Um, one, we're opening two new entrances, one on the far side of our property, and we've also installed a new park side gate. So it will hopefully be much more inviting and easier for our neighbors to get in. We're also putting more signage uh, out. We really had no really good signage um, to direct people in. So it was really just not a feeling of welcoming. So we're hoping that will be a good start. Our long-term strategic plan is ultimately to replace the fence with something that's less imposing, mm -hmm. much more attractive than what we have now, but that's a very expensive um, right. proposition. So. Right. Um, Amy asked, uh, did I notice that Karen incorporated the 1912 plaque in the memorial? If not, what happens to that plaque? Yeah, so the plaque itself is being conserved and it will, it will remain a part of our collection. Uh, Karen did, uh, is um, incorporating a facsimile of the plaque into her memorial. She wanted to reference it and wanted people to, wanted us to be able to talk about it. You know, um, these are the kind of the questions that, that she has in it, so, yeah. Okay. Um, Rick asked, are you getting any resistance from your traditional funding sources for this new New direction in interpretation. You know, so far, not knock on wood, <laughs> not really. I mean, it's interesting because we took a staff professional development trip um, in January, and we visited um, the heavyweights in Virginia. We visited Mount Montpelier, Monticello, and Mount Vernon, and that was some of our frank discussion with them. And particularly Montpelier, it was interesting to hear that they had definitely lost some board members and some funders. Um, Knock on wood, our, the society has been very committed to this and our board has been very committed to it. Um, I think the push will really be if we start talking about do we have a true, whether we call it an advisory group or whatever group where we open up our governance um, to non-dames, how will that play? Mm -hmm. You know, um, but we'll see. Okay. Last question. When will you be open for tours? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, I, I think um, by the end of this month, we're going to be reopening by appointment. Um, we're hoping to get the grounds open a little sooner than that. And then we'll probably be by appointment um, until September. Um, one of our big focuses for the summer, um, and our staff has contracted a little bit as a result of all this, but um, we have a big educational program called History Hunters, which usually brings a lot of school kids through and we're adapting the whole program to be offered virtually and we have about three months to do that in so that's kind of our big focus at the moment yeah i know uh landmarks the pal house is opening uh this weekend so yeah, yeah for little by little hopefully right. we'll be able to open up well if there's nothing else um i i want to thank you again it was very interesting and thank you for sharing your time with us. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. <laughs>